Hello, I'm Ross Wise. I'm a master of wine. And I'm Marcus Ansoms, and I'm a master of wine. And I'm Jeff Moss, and I'm also a master of wine. So, in this video, we're tasting the best that Canada can offer. This is part two, and we're tasting red wines. So, part two, we're gonna taste some red wines. So people outside of Canada probably don't really think about Canada as making red wines. Do you think that's warranted? Uh, no. <laughs> so yeah, I grow grapes in a pretty hot little part of Canada, um, deep in a desert, and um, we get we get some pretty hot yeah, days. Yeah, that's maybe some things people don't know. Like yeah. down, down uh, you know, south of where we are right now, maybe about an hour south, is the southern part of the Okanagan, and that's technically the Sonoran Desert. Yeah, we're pretty hot and dry. We get hotter days than Napa Valley, for example, and longer days, longer daylight hours. So, yeah, it's it's well suited to growing late ripening red varieties for sure. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, we each chose our favourite red variety or blend. Ross, what did you choose? Well, now that I've just talked about late ripening reds, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I chose Pinot Noir, right. <laughs> which is an early ripening red. So um, I've chosen one from Ontario and one from British Columbia, um, but with a bit of a twist. I know when I chose Riesling, I went with the tried and true classics, um, but climate change is a thing. So I'm looking for cooler regions today. Okay. So for our Ontario Pinot Noir, I've chosen Closs and Chase 2020 South Clo Pinot Noir. So this is from Prince Edward County, um, which is a small area right in the middle of Lake Ontario, not quite in the middle, I guess, but in Lake Ontario. So it's really surrounded by a, a big lake, um, which keeps it really cool. And it's quite northerly in Ontario as well. So um, yeah, it's, I would say a marginal climate, but perhaps becoming less so every year with climate change. But Although they are still brewing vines. Yes, a unique uh, a unique perspective. So it does get down to minus 30, for example, in the winter, which grapevines don't like. So they they will bury the vines in the winter to keep the buds alive. Um, also working with geotextiles now, so they don't have to perhaps bury them. But um, yeah, certainly it's on the edge. I think that's, that's a fair comment. Definitely on the edge. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, so, so people who are outside of Canada maybe don't know uh, the different climates. Um, Somewhere like Okanagan Valley, the average winter temperature here is about minus one, say in Penticton, which is the closest town to where we are. Um, in Niagara, it's a little bit lower than that. Um, and there's also uh, a little bit more prolonged cold events. So areas like Niagara have uh, more opportunity to make ice wine, which actually has to occur below about minus eight, generally between about minus eight and minus 12. Um, over here in the Okanagan, we have less opportunity to do that. Um, in Prince Edward County, they're mainly focused on things like uh, Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Noir. What else are they doing all over there? They've got a bit of Riesling. That's it, Chardonnay and Pinot. Chardonnay and Pinot is really their focus. Yeah. Um, and it is, it is uh, yeah, it's a cool climate. There's only 900 um, growing degree days there. No. Yeah, so and maybe the... to, to help situate people, so Niagara on the south side of Lake Ontario, Prince Edward County is on the north side, it's about two hours east of Toronto, or maybe three hours if Ross is driving. But... Yeah, <laughs> traffic, Jeffrey, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I love the Prince Edward County expression of Pinot Noir. To me, it's that, that And you work worked there. I have worked there, I'm a little biased, but um, <laughs> to me it's, that those cooler climates is where Pinot, Pinot Noir has to work a little bit harder to get ripeness and to me the fruit's always so pure and and verging on I, I would call it fresh but in some cases verging on almost tart but in, but, but in, in some ways this is 2020 this is a great vintage so I think perhaps we're seeing a little bit more ripeness and, and really good smashed berry fruit coming through here I'm curious to hear what you oh, this is this is lovely this to me is all you know high toned extremely floral there's almost that sort of VA lift, which I really is, appeals to my sensibilities. Yeah. Um, but there's also there's there's texture and there's there there is a brightness of fruit. But I definitely wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's sour. It's 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 fresh. 
It really just ticks all the boxes. This is a lovely wine. Crunchy is the word. I was going to use crunchy. <laughs> crunchy is stealing each other's words there. there. Yeah. But to, and I also agree to me, what stands out about this wine is the purity of the fruit. It's just yes. so defined. Yeah. And yeah. that's what makes it so enjoyable to drink. Yeah. Serious Pinot Noir. It is serious. So do you want to go to the other end of the country? Sure, let's do it. So, keeping to the cooler area theme, um, from British Columbia, I've chosen Unsworth 2020 Pinot Noir. It's the same vintage. Unsworth is on Vancouver Island in the Cowichan Valley. So, uh, I would say another marginal climate for, for mm. Pinot Noir. Um, yes, it'll get ripe, but it's going to get ripe a lot later than it will, for example, in the Okanagan Valley. Um, so, cooler expression again, um, and to me, I've tried this wine a couple of times, and it's the similar descriptors we were using. Purity of fruit, freshness, crunchy acidity. So I'm curious to hear what you guys think of the island perspective. And I think Unsworth is maybe one of the most exciting brands in Canada right now, in part because it was just acquired by the Jackson family. And I think, you know, Canadians always need people abroad to tell them how good they're doing. But having someone like the Jackson family come and purchase a brand like Unsworth, I think shows the potential that they see, not just in Canadian wine, but in Vancouver Island, in Vancouver Island, you know, more specifically. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah. The more northern regions and coastal regions, yeah, a bit, a bit cooler. This is, this is really interesting to me. It's got, it's, it's got that kind of um, red cherry, but there's that almost truffled character. Yeah. yeah. Um, and to me, that's what I love about this wine. Mm -hmm. Again, that purity of fruit, but with that savoriness, I think that adds a really mm -hmm. interesting dimension. Yeah. And seamless oak, great integration, very fine, chalky tannins. Yeah, I think both these wines are really gentle with the oak. I think perhaps yeah. you see a little more on the Prince Edward County version, but it's beautifully integrated, but it's all about the, the pure fruit, the, the savory character. And I would say, to me, they're both very distinctive. They're both, like, comfortable Definitely. being what they are. Yeah. You know, sometimes in other regions, people really push Pinot. It's quite extracted, uh, quite heavy-handed with the oak. And I think what I love about the county and the island is that producers seem, on the whole, to be comfortable just doing kind of what Pinot should be done there. Yeah, yeah both these styles show a lot of confidence in the winemaking. Um, and they're extremely pretty wines. They're, they're very um, identifiable their good examples of their place and, you know I, 20 years ago there was a real stylistic differences people were searching in Canada what to what varieties they should plant where they should plant them um, what styles they should should impart and there was there was uh, there was lots of examples of what I would say clumsy winemaking uh, like uh, Jeff was saying, maybe over extraction or maybe planting the, the, the wrong varieties in the wrong spots. But these are two great examples of, of, uh, of planting a variety where it's supposed to grow and then giving it the, uh, the capacity to be what it is. And that, yeah, good, good choices. I like them. Well said too. Right on. Yeah. Okay, next, Jeff. What have we got, mate? Uh, I picked Syrah, and I think Syrah does really well in, in two places, really three places in Canada, and that would be Niagara. Now, you don't see a lot of Syrah in Niagara because, unfortunately, it's extremely cold-sensitive, so slim pickings for what we could pick. But uh, what we have from Niagara is Five Rose 2020 Syrah, and Five Rose, really interesting, small, almost garagiste winery but from Lowry Vineyards. And Lowry Vineyards is one of the more historic vineyards in Niagara. Some of the original plantings dating to the 70s and 80s. I don't know when these vines were planted, but it's on St. David's Bench, which probably if you think of- Do you want me to tell you? Do you know? Do you, do you, do you not know my history with this? No. Okay, so I, <laughs> I, was, the, I was the crazy <laughs> that told them to plant Syrah. In yeah, Lowry Vineyards. The Lowry, Lowry's were one of my growers at the time. Oh, it was you they were complaining about. Yeah, that's right. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So apologies to Lowry's. Um, but yeah, basically uh, we were working with Lowry, actually with Pinot Noir at the time, and I convinced them to plant some Syrah and Sauvignon Blanc and actually Cabernet Sauvignon. St. David's is a really hot little site. Um, uh, over 1600 growing degree days um, in St. David. So I would say it's one of those little sub-appellations that really has the capacity to, to grow Syrah well. 
and um, and have it survive and have it survive <laughs> and I'm sure that you know they've had to do some replanting over time um, but the thing with uh, Syrah that's actually good is it, it throws suckers pretty easily um, and particularly in that in that region so um, yeah well, I'm excited to try this because I have not tried this wine for a very long time um, but it was planted at, uh, around 2000 2001 I think okay yeah and so we talked about the 2020 vintage in Agro when we were tasting the Closure Dan Chardonnay, but a warm vintage, you feel that here a little bit with some alcohol, 14.6% alcohol. Mm. Uh, but on the, the nose, it's not, it doesn't come across as ripe as that. And I love that kind of savory, meaty, olivey style. Yeah, that's definitely a savory. It's, it's definitely not savory, big, right? blackberry or jam or anything like that. Yeah, it's definitely peppery, floral, if I, meaty. If yeah. I was to sort of shut my eyes and think okay if I, if I didn't think this was from Canada I'd be sort of I'd be up in Rome oh sure. yeah yeah there's that has that real kind of um, smoky bacon charcuterie and and when I lived in Niagara I always thought Syrah was kind of one of the more underrated varieties just made some fantastic wines again mm -hmm. just suffered in the winter uh, yeah. but just very roan like in character like you said beautiful tannin structure it's oh, really yeah. good yeah quite dense tannins but really elegant and, and fine yeah, yeah. Really that's nice. a beautiful wine yeah, yeah. very nice so yes, thank you yes. for uh, convincing them yeah <laughs> I don't know if they'll feel the same but it's uh, I think it may have been a bit of a challenge over time but um, this is a lovely wine this is yeah it's and great I mean over 20 year old vines now so really starting to come through and I think in BC, the Similkami makes some beautiful Syrah, but I think, you know, the Okanagan maybe is really the best Syrah in Canada. And so we have arguably the top producer for Syrah, which is Le Vieux Pen, uh, coming from the South Okanagan along the Black Sage Bench in Oliver. This is the Equinox Syrah. They make, they have a range of Syrahs, the, their entry level, the Cuvée Violette, very beautiful, it's a lovely wine. Marcus was paying, so we just went top of the line. Yeah. And this is the Equinox. <laughs> this is the Equinox 2020 Syrah. Yeah. Yeah, I think Syrah's really got a home in the, in the Black Sage bench. Maybe it didn't enjoy mm -hmm. its home this last winter. But uh, it, to me, it's like one of the top three or four regions in the world for Syrah. I just love what Okanagan Syrah does when it gets that yeah. right, savory, olive, roasted herb kind of character. Totally. Yeah. totally. I love I, working with it. Yeah. I think it's the top red variety in the Okanagan, especially the South Okanagan, and I think it's not particularly close to, to number two. Yeah. So this is yeah. a big one, Jeffrey. This is yeah, so this, I mean, Equinox, I think, typically definitely that riper, more extracted, fuller bodied style, but still balanced with kind of like that desert shrub character that you mm. get from the South Okanagan, sagebrush. And I think that helps to balance the ripeness of the fruit. I like that desert shrub, I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for people who don't know, in the Southern part of the valley here, we have a lot of sagebush. It just grows native. And uh, sometimes you see that quality come through in the, in the, uh, in the fruit, it reminds me a little bit of that Gary character sometimes you get in in uh, in uh, Southern Rhone and, and Languedoc. So this is like the ripeness is it's big there. It's, it's lots of ripe berry fruit. Um, the structure is dense and, and there's a lot of tannin there, but at the same time it's really fresh. It's really retained its freshness and acidity, which is a balancing act. So yeah, and, and that's what I love about Okanagan Syrah. You kind of talked about it being hot in the South Okanagan, uh, long days, but it. Syrah just loves that heat and yeah. it retains that freshness and it's why yeah. it does so well. It is. Like Syrah for me, you know, I, I grew up making Syrah in cool climate area in Australia and um, it reminds me a lot of the Okanagan where you have the real marked continental climate and that's where I think Syrah survives and thrives is where you've got big fluctuations between, between uh, winter temperature, summer temperature, daylight temperature, um, evening temperature. That seems to really bring out that that sort of je ne sais quoi that Syrah has. And this is a great example. It's there's for me. It's just like this um, this unctuousness, this uh, this voluminous palette that is um, perhaps you don't see in some of the other varieties. Uh, often the tannin sort of sticks out or the acidity sticks out, but this this has the fruit weight and and stuffing to to bring it all together. Yeah, just yeah, really world class, and I think. One of the things that I find interesting, you know, with the Niagara Five Rose, we talked about it being Rhone-like, 
but to me, Okanagan's Rod is very distinctive on mm -hmm. its own. Like the only place maybe you could compare it to is Walla Walla, Syrah, or mm -hmm. something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But but to me, there's no point trying to compare this to the Rhone because it's, it's nowhere near that. It's, it's really its own beast. Yeah, and depending on the site too, you, you can get a, a lot of that really pronounced black pepper character. Um, you know, I think Black Sage, Soyuz, Golden Mile. Um, in certain vintages, it, it really does get quite peppery and quite sage-like, and that that is very distinctive. Like if you if you line that up in blind tastings, that that really sticks out, and that to me says that it, it uh, definitely has a place. Good wines, excellent wines. Well yeah. Okay. On to the next one. Okay, we're on to our last style. We had a little bit of debate about this actually, didn't we? Um, we were talking about, you know, maybe Cabernet Franc is the variety that is most consistent across the country. Um, but ultimately, uh, I chose red blends. So in particular, I think Bordeaux blends do really well in lots of the different um, climates that we've got. Primarily because Bordeaux blends have different ripening times. Um, it gives you the capacity to, to work with the vintage variation that you that you get in Canada. We are a cool climate, you know, there's there's aspects of being very warm in some, some areas, but the reality is that we do have some vintage variation and this plays really well into that sort of Bordelais concept of, of, uh, of altering your blend depending on what the season gives you. Yeah. So, two wines I chose. Two different, two different regions. You haven't seen one of the regions before, but um, maybe I'll go with that first. Yeah, I'll do this one first. Okay, so what I've chosen is La Friends Cabernets. So this is Rocky Fellow Vineyard. This is um, this is in the Golden Mile. So this is uh, we're in Naramata filming this right now. So we're maybe an hour south. Uh, Golden Mile is um, on the western side of the valley, down um, between a Soyuz and Oliver, and it's marked by uh, some interesting um, glacial and ex-riverbed activity. So there's there's deep loams with lots of gravels and pudding stones, and and this gives the the area some some uniqueness. Um, it's quite hot around about. Uh, uh, close to 1600 I think it's maybe 1550 something like that uh, heat units so it's uh, produces consistently um, uh, those late ripening varieties very well so this is a blend actually of Cabernet uh, Franc Cabernet Sauvignon and this year uh, um, and I hadn't tried this vintage until I, I uh, purchased it um, has about 9% Syrah often that is um, that substituted with Merlot um, they have, uh, they have, I think, Malbec and Merlot planted at this vineyard, but for this vintage, they chose a little bit of Syrah, so let's give it a go. And I think you see that more and more often in the Okanagan producers augmenting or hermitaging their Bordeaux blend with a little bit of Syrah. I mean, Ross, I think you do that. Yeah, I, I make a cap Syrah. To me, to me, the Syrah tannins are just so complementary to any Bordeaux tannins, and, and obviously the fruit works well as well. But yeah, I, I love it for, from a texture perspective. I think Syrah can really, at, at small percentages like this, can really bring something else and some silkiness mm. and elegance. I think it adds like a distinctiveness to Okanagan red blends as well, and, and just the wines are better as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I obviously, from my accent, I'm Australian, but um, and Australia kind of was one of the countries that that, that led that Cabernet Shiraz um, idea of blending. And for me, it never really, I never really understood it um, because I found that it it it, uh, it made the Bordeaux blends maybe taste like something else, and it took away the distinctiveness of, of Syrah. But at this level, you know, in that sort of five to ten percent range. I think this really this really works like just generally as stylistic. I don't actually tried it right, but uh, it's uh, I like the, I like that uh, that at that level I think it makes sense. Yeah, I agree. So thoughts? I love the aroma. I think the mm. fruit is just to me the perfect level of ripeness. It's ripe, but it's it's still just fresh and. Um, 
the oak is beautifully integrated. I haven't tried it yet, but the taste of it yet, but the on the on the nose, it just it all comes together and just. Mm. For me, the Cabernet Franc really stands out with yeah. this. There's that that high tone kind of licorice and violet character that that I always um, uh, denote as as Cabernet Franc. Mm. I think it was uh, it spent. Yeah, 20 months in French oak Greeks. Um, and it's it's a lovely wine. It's balanced. It's got <clears throat> fine tannins. There's um, there's freshness of fruit. It, um, you know, it'd be hard pressed. If you had this wine in a tasting, it would be tough to find out, what, you know, for, to say, okay, this is, this is uh, not from the US or this is not from, yeah. from, uh, France, or it's a it's a well-made Bordeaux blend. Yeah, I really like Bordeaux blends from that side of the valley because I think they they retain a bit of freshness, and also I think those gravelly, deep gravelly soils they bring a bit more structure to the wine, and I mm. think this wine's got that density of structure and perhaps darker fruit than you'd see on the other side of the valley, which is the Black Sage Bench, where I do most of my work, where it's all about purity and mm -hmm. um, finesse. So I think that the structure of that side of the valley is really interesting. So maybe maybe you should talk a little bit the difference between, say, the soils in Black Sage yeah. versus Golden Mile. Yeah, so I think you described Black, uh, Golden Mile really well. It's the gravelly soils. Um, if you think about it as a volume, there's not much soil there because there is so much gravel. So it's really dry soils, rocky soils. Um, it also is close, it's tucked into a, a big mountain range, so it loses the sun pretty early in the evening. And to me, that gives it a cooler expression than the other side of the valley, which mm. gets the hot evening sun. So the other side of the valley, it's deep sands, really light textured sands. Like if you pick they're up black, a black, they're black sands. Yeah, there's black specks through the sand. Yeah. yeah, but they just retain so much heat. And to me, the fruit there, it's pure, it's delicate, um, it's 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 really fine, and the, the structure there is much more fine than the tannins. Um, really elegant wines versus, I think, more density and perhaps complexity on the other side. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you. There you go. <laughs> right on. Okay, so that's our first example. And the next one I've chosen is actually from the Similkameen Valley. So Similkameen Valley um, is a valley that basically runs east-west and it starts in the south of the Okanagan Valley. So if you think about it, the Okanagan Valley is running north to south, and then you have this adjunct that goes from east to west that joins up with the Okanagan Valley um, just south of uh, 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 Oliver, like in Soyuz. Uh, it, takes a, it takes a leg um, up the valley there. So um, I guess the thing that marks the Smilkameen Valley is the Smilkameen River. The Smilkameen River runs right through this valley. It's a relatively narrow valley, and it's one of those places where I think site selection plays a huge uh, role. Uh, what you tend to find is that the um, up along uh, the edges of the mountains uh, there, you've got these, these um, dark granite soils. They're very, very rocky. Um, but as you get closer to the river, you have some deep gravel loams and more, more um, uh, obvious sandstone uh, weathered uh, river rocks. So uh, as you approach the, uh, the, the steep granite slopes, they're really hot. Like they, they, I would say generally those sites are the hottest sites in Canada, yeah. flat out most heat units most most you know you can ripen almost every variety you can think of the problem with a smilkameen is that you don't have that moderating influence of the lakes you do have the moderating influences of the river um, but it, it, it's not as huge a body of water as say like lake okanagan or a soyuz or skaha lake so that means that winter temperatures can sometimes be more volatile down down there. So it is a little bit of a Russian Russian roulette, um, but for the most part, I think they make beautiful late ripening varieties. So things like Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, uh, Viognier, all those varieties do very well in the Smilkameen Valley. So this is a uh, Corsolets. This is Talus. This comes from the 2020 vintage also um, and this is a blend of 40% Merlot, 35% Cabernet Franc, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, 
3% Malbec and 2% Petit Verdot. Really intense pure fruits on this. Yeah. To me, it's compared to the previous wine, the ripeness is probably up there a step, and the intensity of, of fruit, it's it's really bold, um, but but so pure and elegant as well. I think the Merlot really shines through, sort of plummy cherry character, um, and beautifully integrated oak as well. The thing that really um, jumps out for me are those extremely resolved tannins. Yeah. Like it's uh, it's it's creamy and it's. Um, it's velvety and there's uh, there's obvious ripe tannins, which is you know a hallmark of kind of a, a good Bordeaux growing region is if you're able to, to ripen those tannins adequately. And uh, yeah, there's a this is a this is a mouthful of wine. It's a big wine. <laughs> yeah. And probably of any region in Canada, I'd almost argue the Similkameen is the most identifiable across multiple grape varieties. It has this very saline minerality, especially it comes through in the whites, a little bit easier to pick up. Um, but I think, you know, I can't think of another region in Canada that has that same distinctive character. Yeah, agreed. Well, that was fun, guys. That was a good good bunch of wines and hopefully you guys learned <laughs> something and uh, we didn't, uh, didn't bore you to death. We'd love to hear your comments, uh, questions. We'll do our best to get back to you. I'll make sure that the, the guys uh, get your questions and if you want to address them um, directly, then please do that. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. That was fun. Thanks was for organizing that. Was that was fun. Yeah, that's fun. Awesome. If you like this, then uh, hit the like and subscribe it. That's you, Buffett. Well, I thought you were going to do the intro. No, we're doing the same thing as before. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> okay. No, you can go. No, keep going. Just keep going. Just, just go. keep going. Let it run. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ross Wise. I'm a master of wine. I'm Marcus Ansoms. I'm a master of wine. <laughs> <laughs> master. We're going to try to get it. Do it again.